there we go. Welcome to the show. My name is Sam Otero, coming to you live from my studios in the beautiful mountains of central Pennsylvania. You are tuning into the Kinetic Hope in Motion. What we do here is we uncover stories of hope and redemption, people that have been struggling with addiction issues in their lives and have found their way to help uh, help their families grow and get, uh, get right on the right path with their Lord and, uh, well, come to healing and come to a better place in their life. So today we have a very, very powerful story. When I heard this story, it really moved me. I, Aaron and Kyle Hefner are joining us tonight on the show, live in the studio. This is the first time that we've actually done a dual interview, so uh, it took us a little while to get set up, and really, it's, it's very powerful testimony. And I'm just absolutely and completely honored, and I got up this morning and thanking the Lord for this opportunity to be able to provide this point of inspiration, because really, it... It, it blew me away. When, when you hear what this young couple has been through, what their family has been through, and how they came to God to be able to get on the right track and save their marriage, it's really quite a testimonial. So um, I would take this opportunity to invite you in our viewing audience to please share and like this video send it out on social media because it's very powerful and there's really quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a bit that we can all learn from this and I'm hoping that maybe somebody that is watching this and struggling with addiction issues in their lives maybe has a spouse or a family member that is not quite on board with what they need to do or feel that God is calling them to do to get right in their heart and get their spirit right so that they can heal and get clean. You know, this story should motivate you and move you. And we hope that you stick around for the interview and uh, share it. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up our guests now and kill the music as we're going here. So, welcome to the Kinetic. Here we have our special guest today. Whoop, let me go ahead and pull them up. And uh, I think we got their audio. Let's go ahead and test their audio. Kyle and Aaron Hefner, let me go ahead and hear you guys. All right. Yeah, we got you. There you go. Let me go ahead and set this split screen up here. And we'll bring you in and have a conversation. There we go. Excellent. So, um, I, guys, you told me your whole story offline, and it is incredibly powerful, incredibly motivational. And I'd like for you just to tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, before we get into the issues that you dealt with and how you came to God to help rebuild your family and restore your family. Tell us just who you are and what brought you to central Pennsylvania. You're living here in Dubois now, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, um, Aaron, if you want to go ahead and start with you, tell us your family's history here. Yeah. Um, so I was born in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I was raised by my stepfather and mother. Um, I also had a stepmother in there from my dad's previous marriage, um, who has come to become a second mother to me, so she's a huge part in this as well. But um, probably around middle school, we moved up here. Um, my stepdad's family is from up here, um, and he also started a new job up here. Um, probably it would have been eighth grade, I started to do boys high school um, and then graduated went to Clarion University um, right before I went to college a year or two in I met Kyle um, and we got engaged shortly after I graduated um, college we were married we've been married seven seven years almost seven years, almost seven years. yep we have two great children we have Lily who is five 
and Wyatt, who is three. And um, like Sam said, we, we live in Rockton. So um, that's where we've been the past seven years together. So do you anything you want to add? No, you did good. <laughs> Doing great, and 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 let me say again, I, I preface the show with this, but I want to thank you two for coming on because, I mean, this was this is, this is quite a story, and to share this publicly, in any venue, let alone on the internet, so widely, and we live in a very small town where everybody knows everybody. This is take this is a bold move and taking a lot of courage, on your part and conviction on your part. And I want to thank you, number one, uh, for the pe and, and for the audience, the people that are listening, that are going to be gaining from this. Um, why don't we start the conversation with, with your spiritual motivation here? You credit God with saving your marriage. You, and it's quite a story. We'll get into the details there here in a few minutes. But Aaron, tell me about what's motivating you to share this story in this venue you said this is what you felt that god is having you do and i understand that which is what the kinetic is all about this is my mission because that's what happened to me you know god said get out there and tell your story and and use your talents and your technology to help others do there so i get it get into deeper uh, detail for us about that um You'll hear later on about my struggle um, with my addiction and going through rehab, but probably five days into my detox, you know, I felt God coming to me, um, telling me he was there with me. It was a really, really rough couple days, and I had given up hope just in those five days of detoxing. Um, but God showed himself, and he said, Aaron, you're not alone. Um, and he really helped me through the next 26 days of recovery. Um, shortly after I got out of rehab, um, Kyle and I were, were not in a good place, but his faith was so strong at that time and it made me just wanna be a better person and be better in my faith, just seeing him, even though we weren't you know, together, um, just watching him uh, really motivated me to want to become a better person. Um, this has been very hard to share our story, um, especially because we do live in such a small town and I have faced so much judgment, I've faced so much criticism, I've faced so much um, torment from people trying to judge me and, and tell me what I should be doing and shouldn't be doing. But, you know, there's, there's a saying out there, it's from Bethel Music, and it's, it's, you know, I am no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God, and God has reminded me of that throughout this, and he's been saying, Aaron, you don't need to be scared of what people are saying, I have you, and I want you to share this story, and I want you to show people um, that I, I am here, and I am with them, and I will take them out of this addiction. So I've just really been leaning on those words. Um, God keeps pressing them on my heart. And so throughout this whole process, I, I've just come to realize like, don't be scared, Aaron, he has you. And he's not letting go and you need to share this. Wow, very, very powerful. We appreciate the conviction. And uh, Kyle, uh, as her husband here, as her life partner in this and fellow warrior in this battle would you care to elaborate a little bit on the spiritual component of what you folks have been through and where you are now and and coming out publicly what she just said would you elaborate a little bit on that from your standpoint yeah i guess uh i would just say that what we've been through um the last 10 months uh it's been really hard um but you know through our faith we've been able to uh slowly rebuild things and um you know put our lives back together and i guess we both just feel that if our story um could help someone whether you know whether it be one person or uh, you know a whole room of people um to hear what god's done in our lives um you know to be able to help somebody you know it would be worth it. So. 
Well, that's wonderful, and we really appreciate it. As I said, I'm sure the audience appreciates it. And um, well, it, let me ask you guys this: in terms of your your where you are or where you were spiritually, were you always Christians? I mean. We, you know, we as people, I mean, we're human beings, we're sinners, we fall away, Absolutely. we get right, we yeah. fall away. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's an ongoing struggle, a daily struggle, and for some people it's a bigger struggle than others. Have you always been believers? I, uh, I grew up going to church, you know, I'm born and raised uh, local, um, mm -hmm. come from a, a, you know, Christian family. <laughs> and, uh, always, you know, I, I always knew you know, like everybody, right from wrong, and you kind of, like, you, you get to a point in your life, you think you, you know what's best for you, and you kind of go down your own path, um, so I think this whole experience, at least for me, was kind of an eye-opener of, uh, you know, not just going to church on Sunday and, and leaving it there, but, you know, living it every day, you're of the week rather you know a lot of people go to church and say well I go to church and uh, you know that to a lot of people is good enough and um, it's it's about living it every day and uh, you know that's what I've gained from all this yeah just definitely right. feeding off of that a little bit um, you know I did grow up in the church but we we Feeding off of what Kyle said, we were churchgoers. We went to church, and then after that, church was church. Um, Kyle's right. You need to be the church. You need to live like the church. You have to, you know, make it a priority right. in your life. It can't just be Sunday. I'm going to go to church, sing a few gospels, listen to what the preacher says, take it all in, mm -hmm. walk away, and practice any of it. Um, you're never going to get good. You're never going to get better. Um, that's kind of how I see it. So we have really, really, as a couple, been trying to instill in our children, like, God is not just church. God is everything. Um, and you can't just go to church. We need to practice it every day. We do devotionals as a family. We pray every day as a family. We, you know, if someone, if our child has fall, fallen and hurt their knee, you know, we pray for them. We stop and pray. We let them know that, you know, God is is amazing and and that's why we're here today and that's why i can say mommy is better is because of god and well they know that and it's just it's just a great feeling that's amazing well let's go ahead and jump right into it then we have <laughs> our background now tell us about your story you were a professional life was going along and you got hurt. I did, yeah. Um, and and you know what? I, I got to say this too. Of the ex-addicts that have come on this show, I the story has been the same. Very similar. <clears throat> they get hurt, they get injured, and it's the pain medication that Correct. eventually gets them, gets them, well, gets them. So your story is not uncommon. No, not at all. Um, so what was life like for you, Erin, before this happened to you and this tragedy befell your family? Um, I thought we had a good life. I thought we were living what we should have been living. We were living the way God wanted us to, but much to my dismay, we didn't um, there's things that we needed to improve upon. And, you know, he definitely made us aware of that after, you know, my recovery. But, um... Like I just said, life life was going good. I had a beautiful daughter at the time, and I was about ready to give birth to my son Wyatt. Um, and then shortly after Wyatt, everything crumbled down. So, well, tell tell us about the genesis of the problem. Um, shortly after I gave birth to Wyatt, I started having um, some pretty bad abdominal pain. I went to the doctors mm -hmm. and ended up needing a surgery probably two months after I gave birth to my son. Um, I was nursing at the time, so um, I really couldn't take pain medicine. Um, they could with me, they gave me the only pain medicine that I was allowed to have. Um, shortly after that, um, I ended up 
drying up in the process of nursing and not being able to nurse him anymore. So they ended up giving me some medication after a second surgery. Um, when it started, um, you know, the, the multiple surgeries I had had following my son's birth, I won't go into details, but um, some women issues, um, sure. which uh, it took me about three surgeries to, to lead up to the major one in between those three surgeries. Of course, I would have pain medicine, opioids, of course. Um, I didn't think it was a problem until after the third time I had had a surgery and I was like, okay, the pain medicine you're giving me is not working like it did the first time. And that is pretty sad to say after the third surgery because, um, I mean, I didn't think that what I was doing was a problem because I was being prescribed these medications um, and ended up coming to terms that I needed a hysterectomy. Um, as soon as I had the hysterectomy, I had some major problems. Um, I could not go to the bathroom, so I ended up going to the ER where they placed a catheter, and in the process of placing the catheter, they nicked my bladder and I became septic. Ended up being admitted to the hospital in intense pain um, and just kept being pumped full of pain medication. Um, after that, I was given pain medication for about another month until I started to heal from the procedure. And ended up going from a routine surgery to an infection to sepsis to a bunch of other problems. Um, after that surgery, that's when I knew it had became a problem um, because I knew that I just needed more. Obviously, taking the, I was taking three pills at a time when you were supposed to be one, and those three were not even touching any of the pain I was having. Um, I started then making up reasons as to why I needed the pain medicine, medication and justify why I needed it. I would call the doctor and say, listen, I'm having such pain when in the back of my mind, I knew it wasn't pain at all. It was all a mind game. I had been healed from this procedure for almost two months. Um, they were so given... uh, let me let me stop you there. Explain that a little bit more, because right there, there's the genesis of the addiction mm -hmm. where you're. You, you just said it. It was a mind game. It was. You were perpetrating upon yourself mm -hmm. to convince yourself that your actions were justified and mm -hmm. needed. So what were you thinking at the time? You said you knew you you were healed and you weren't really having pain. Mm -mm. Were you having withdrawal symptoms if you didn't have the pain medication? Absolutely. I think that's why I was justifying it because I said, I'm not feeling good. So obviously it's from the surgery. It's not me withdrawing. Um, right. So it was very easy to, to in my mind, justify why I, why I was taking the pain medication. Um, Let's see. So. So how long did this, how long did this phase continue, and at what point did you, uh, well, really, start to see yourself go off the rails here? I started seeing myself going off the rails when I when I realized that they were no longer going to prescribe me the medication, and I had a moment of panic. Um, mode of panic where I couldn't breathe. I had a full-blown anxiety attack trying to figure out ways that I was going to get this medication. Um, it, especially, you know, I think they were kind of catching on, like she doesn't have these issues. Um, when they started catching on, I was like, oh no, I'm caught. I'm going to have to go to other methods to get this medication because they obviously know that I'm not in pain. Um, so when I started having that feeling of fear and that feeling of panic, that's when I knew, Aaron, you have a problem and, and it's a big problem and, you know, this isn't gonna, gonna stop on its own, so. So, Kyle, at this time, from your standpoint, her spouse, you guys are living together, you're watching this happen. <clears throat> at what point did you come to this conclusion that there was, there was a problem? He, I had no clue. None hit it so well. I had it down to a science. Moving forward a little bit, I had it down to a point where I knew when I could take that medication that I was not high so that my husband would not see me high or when I was not going to be driving my kids or when I was going to be old and my husband was going to be working late. I knew it was like a math project to me. I knew when I could take these so that I could not. Um, you know, I 
put them in a antibiotic container so that he thought I was taking antibiotics. So as I'm taking the pills, he thinks it's for something completely different than what it really was. He truly had no idea. I was so good at it, and I am so embarrassed to say that I was good at it. Wow. Well, Kyle, at one point, obviously, you know, things didn't go didn't go well mm -hmm. in your marriage. So at some point, you had to have come to this conclusion that there was that there was an issue. Yeah. How, how did how did all this happen? How did it all come out? I I found out actually through our bank, um, you know, there were some financial issues and I called the bank to, to see about straightening things out. And, uh, you know, time to find out a lot of things through that. So I confronted Aaron, um, you know, about that. And that's when, you know, she came clean with, with the addiction. Um, you know, leading up to it, I knew something was wrong. Um, but I didn't know what, yeah. you know, and I never, never imagined it would have been drugs um, because there was a disconnect between us, um, you know. Uh, she, she wasn't the, the woman that I married, and I was, I was trying to figure out why, but, you know, I had no... You know, his mom even pointed out, like, there is something going on with Aaron. I just cannot put my finger on it. Um, so they kind of had a, an idea, but who would have ever thought in their right mind that their wife would have been addicted to to pain medication, especially when I was so good at hiding it. And were you were you maintaining your career at that time? I was, working? yeah. You know really? what, and it got so you to were, the you point. Were, you were what we would call a functional addict. I ex it's exactly, and you know, it got to the point where I was telling, you know, I told them in rehab where I wasn't taking to get high, I was taking so I wasn't getting sick. Um, it did, it did get to the point, well. like, yeah. you took so that you weren't sick, that you were able to function to be that functionable addict. Um, of course, there was times where you do get high, and I would just say that I was giddy or full of energy. I'm sure there was times where Kyle would notice that I had more energy than normal. But sure. why would he ever think in his right mind that it was drugs? I mean, I had him fooled, and, and it's not something I'm proud of. And how long of a period of time did this, this? Trend? I was addicted for probably two and a half years before two and I got half caught. Years mm -hmm. before I got. Oh wow! Before you know, God's like, no more, Aaron. <laughs> no more. That is amazing. L let me ask you this, and for the knowledge, <clears throat> the education of our audience. Mm -hmm. People that are out there that might be listening, that are sitting and scouting, hey, look, we all know this has reached epidemic proportions, in, not just mm -hmm. here in central Pennsylvania, but in our nation. It is an epidemic. It is a major problem. Oh, absolutely. What advice can you folks give? And let's, let's take one at a time mm -hmm. here. Not to make people paranoid, but you know what? If they're turning in, if they're tuning in right now, a lot of people are tuning in because they're facing issues in their own family. A lot mm -hmm. of people are tuning in because they're looking for hope. They're looking for stories of inspiration. That's why we're doing this. What advice can you give them as to what to look for in a family member who may be struggling with this problem? Um, Aaron, let's start with you. In hindsight. What sort of activities did you engage in or behaviors did you exhibit that looking back were pretty much clear giveaways? Mm -hmm. Had had anybody really, really been looking down that avenue? Um, I mean, like you had explained, there's a lot more in between that my story that I'm not gonna get into, but there no, is some course, clear signs that, that I, I was, um, I was always very routine and when I took something, I would always know, like, um, right after shower, I would go to the bathroom. Right after these times, like, I was very routine. The times that I would use the bathroom, the times where I would go somewhere, the times that I would do things. Also, I was going to bed at 6.30, 7 o'clock and blaming it on something else. Um, I would have very um, much so highs and lows, bipolar. Um, um, you know, there was times in my where I'm screaming out inside, like, just catch me already. Like, the signs are right there. Um, but they weren't. I mean, they weren't. Um, 
you know, one of the one of the many signs that were good was I would trip a lot. We just called, you know, I, I was clumsy. I would say I'm a clumsy girl, and I always did have a very silly personality. Everybody knew that I was very mm. outgoing, very silly. So everyone just put it off as me being being silly. But how many times can you trip in a day before it's not silly? So mm. those were signs that I knew that I'm like, oh no, that I'm going to get busted. But yeah. it'll be interesting to hear what Kyle has to say because he's seeing it from a different perspective. Right, and we're looking in hindsight, as they say, is always twenty twenty. So, Kyle, looking back over those mm -hmm. years now, what could you say that you that you wish you would have clued in on at the time? Um, definitely, you know, like uh, she would, like she said, go to bed really early, and I'd I'd ask her like, why why are you going to bed so early? And she's, oh, I'm tired, or you know, I work today. I'm like, well, you know, everybody works at six o'clock, <laughs> you know. Um, but the lies was the big thing for me, um, before I found out there, I come close to catching her several times, you know, there was things I'd question her about and, um, she'd always have a good enough excuse that, I was you know, so good I, at lying. I, uh, wouldn't necessarily believe her, but it, it satisfied me enough to where, well, you know, she's my wife. She, some of the stuff she was lying about was stuff I'm like, you can't make that up. Who would make that up? So right. I just kind of and, and it, it could off. have been about anything. It could have just been about it. No, you whatever. can ask her if it was sunny outside and she'd say yes and it'd be pouring down rain. You know, and that's believe it. Me. It, it, it got to that. Right, yeah, I you know, understand. I'm, look out the window, I'd be like, well, whatever, you know. And looking back, it was like maybe I should have pursued things a little more rather than just taking, you know, thinking, you know, this is my wife. She's not going to lie about that. Um, so that was probably the big thing. You know, there's little stuff, uh, you know, mood swings weren't there early on in her relationship. And she's, you know, try to have a normal conversation. You know, if she thought you was maybe attacking her or questioning her, it turned into, you know, like a I'm leaving kind of fight over something stupid. Or, or minuscule. Or, yeah. yeah, something minor that, you know, shouldn't upset somebody to the point of, you know, leaving. So the, things would get out of, things would get blown out of proportion. You right. would see uh, manic depressive type behavior. Absolutely. Yeah. Mood. Yeah. Well, Let's just jump right to it. We know what life was like at that time. How did the crash and burn happen? Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> you want me to tell it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, I see you're getting emotional. I, I really, again, I want to say, you know, how honored I am to have you two on my show, in my home sharing this story with my audience i it brings me to tears and mm -hmm. i can't thank you enough and it reinforces my faith that god is real and god yeah. is in control and is changing lives right here in our community so aaron god bless you i I, you. I know it's hard so um uh if you're ready go ahead and proceed um I just remember I had just got off of work. It was about 2.30 at home. Um, I always go home right after work, even though I had to pick up my children because I would always go home um, to, like, get my pills and things like that. Um, I then had to go and pick up my children, which at the time were at daycare. As I was driving in to get them, um, Kyle had called me, and he was at the bank. And he, as soon as I picked up the phone, he said, Aaron, what's going on? I said, what are you talking about? Like, I'm like, what, what, what do you mean what's going on? And he goes, I'm at the bank and there is no money, no savings, no anything in our bank account. Where is our money? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I tried to deny it. I'm like, uh, um, and finally I just broke down and I was like, I, I, I just spewed it. I'm like, I'm addicted to these pain medications. Um, 
I had been using all of our money to get the pain medication. Um, little did he know that, that that was not all that was happening. Later on, you'll find out that I had done some other pretty not so good things, um, just besides so the finances. So you just and blah. I did. It was word clean. vomit. It was literally word vomit. I'm like, wow. you know, this is it. I'm caught. It's great. And you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, thank God. I was like, thank God I'm caught. Thank you, God, I'm caught. But in the back of my mind, I'm also, I'm like, oh my gosh, I was caught. Um, so I'll let you tell from your point of view, and then I'll, I'll kind of go into how they kind of had a little intervention on me at his parents' house. We go, and we're all sitting down. My parents come over. Everybody's crying in the back of my mind. I'm like, why are you guys crying? Like, it was literally something that you would see from that intervention show. Like, why is everybody crying? I'm right here. Like, nothing's wrong with me. I took some drugs. I'm fine. Um, I'm sorry I blew off our money, but we'll get it back. I was literally being so ignorant. It was it was not me. But just so you know, I did not pick up my kids. My mother-in-law picked up my kids, and she was driving them around while my husband and I were talking. And I was so mad that at that time, I had just taken probably two handfuls of pills. So when I got to the so-called intervention, I was just so carefree. I really, I really, I, I didn't care. I didn't care at all. Um, you know, and it, now I look back on it and my family, uh, you know, I had to see my family crying and remembering my family bawling and my in-laws bawling and me just sitting there like so carefree. It's so, it's, it's, my behavior was so disgusting. Um, but go ahead. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say? <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about the intervention. How did you get the rest of the family involved? Well, uh, I had called the bank, um, and the woman I spoke with at the bank, she says, you, you need to come in here. You know, something's not right. So I went in, and she informed me what, was, what she thought was going on. So I called Aaron, and, you know, she didn't come out and say, well, I'm addicted to drugs. She said, I'm an addict. And I was like, well, what do you mean you're an addict? And w there was a several phone calls in there because she was being very, you know. I was great. Volatile, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And I had enough sense. I called my mom because I knew Aaron was going to pick the kids up. And I called my mom. I said, are you in town? And she said, yes. I said, can you go get the kids? She's like, why? I'm like, go get the kids. Don't go home. Don't go to my house. Just drive. Just drive them around. Mm -hmm. I was at this point so mad. I was about ready to so, call the police. It was bad. Um, my mom picked up the kids, and shortly, maybe a minute later, Aaron calls me screaming, you know, she wanted the kids and this and that. So I was able to talk her into meeting me in town. She met uh, me at my work. Um, and we ended up, I told her, I said, get in the truck. I'm going to figure this out. Um, so we're going to my parents' house, and I called her parents. I said, hey, can you meet me at my parents' house, you know, at this point, Aaron had come clean. It was drugs. And I said, we, we need to have, I guess you'd call it an intervention. It was more or less just a, we need to figure out what's going on. Um, she was starting to call the police because I called her parents. and oh, wow. I, was, uh, I was out of it. You know, it, it now, Kyle, at this point, what are you thinking? You're, you're, she said drugs, but did did she explain was the the nature of it and where it came from and that it was the pain pills or were you thinking I honestly harder stuff no I yeah I mean at that point I, I guess I was just kind of in survival mode I was just yeah. trying I, I really wasn't focusing so much on um the addiction as okay I gotta make sure my kids are all right I gotta you know right. that that's what I was thinking about it wasn't until after. And I can imagine, based on her previous behavior, too, at this point, you got to be sitting there going, I don't know what to believe and not to believe. Yeah, well, um, that was a Thursday. That was um, August 30th. So that was Thursday afternoon. Uh, right. <clears throat> Friday, I took off of work. I was able to get her into a rehab, um, and she left for the rehab Saturday morning. Uh, me and my mom gave her a ride and dropped her off. So Friday I was kind of working on getting everything set up with that. Um, but once she got into rehab, that's when I had, you know, I kind of sat down. And the following week, you know, I started finding out just how bad things were, um, you know.
And it, that's when things started to really sink in, I guess. So. And this is, my goodness, we're not even talking a year ago here. I will be nine months clean as of June 1st. My So this is still goodness. pretty fresh. Yeah. Incredibly fresh. Well, okay, so we had the family. Let's keep going with the story here. We had the family yeah. intervention. Yeah, this is where place? it gets tough. Yeah. How how did that? I can I can't even imagine how that went. Um, it was. Uh, it was more more or less just like wh why you know, and like Aaron had said, she kind of played it off like it was no big deal, and we're all like, yeah, this is a big deal. You know, we need to get uh, it figured out. You know, at first I was like, look, well, you got to quit your job. Um, we'll get cleaned up. Yeah, I didn't know what we were getting into. I didn't know how bad it was. And then, you know, that night I kind of went home and was it. And I was like, you know, we don't have the we means to yeah. detox. You know, she needs to go to her rehab. Um, so, uh, but as far as the, the intervention, you know, it was just a lot of just why, you know. Everybody just wanted to know why and how and, you know. All that nothing too in depth, I would say. Now, at that time, Aaron, when you're faced with your family, now at that point, you had come clean to your husband. How did you handle the rest of the family? Did you explain deeper at the time? What, what, from your standpoint, how did they, how did this intervention go? And like I said, I, I really am not going to lie. I there in, in, in the right mind. Um, but like I said, as far as I took it, I was like, why is everybody crying? I'm not dead. I'm alive. Um, we're going to get me help and everything's going to be fine. That's how I I'm kind of annoyed that everybody was crying. And again, looking back on it, I'm like, wow, how dare you sit there and laugh at them for being concerned about you? minimize it yeah mm -hmm. yeah my goodness so you have the intervention you mm -hmm. decide rehab is the solution mm -hmm. yes yeah a 30-day intensive rehab yeah okay now you told me your story offline and I know as difficult as it is to talk about we know it gets worse believe it or not from here so um, but the good news is, again, God's in control, and you guys came back around, and your story of redemption and love and commitment and faith is an inspiration. So just hang in there with us, and let's, let's get through the tough part here, and then we'll get to, uh, to the glory. So, go ahead. So um, the first seven days was a blackout period where I was toxin off of the medication. Um, mind you, I was taking medical grade fentanyl, so my detox was very intense. Um, I took multiple seizures. Um, I was sent via ambulance twice from the rehab facility that was actually able to handle detoxes. They couldn't even handle mine. It was that bad. Um, the hospital to be helped because I was beyond their capacity to help, I guess. Um, during those seven days of detox, like you said, I, they claimed that I was one of the worst detox I've ever seen, and I probably day five of going through the detox, it wasn't getting better. Um, I remember there was pictures on the wall, and I was in the room with my roommate, and she was in the shower, and I remember saying to myself, like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I remember pulling pictures off the wall and taking the nails out of the pictures and I was cut myself and I was like I don't want to do this anymore and the point that I was hurting myself was the point I realized like Aaron you're out of control you're out of control and if you had if you had God in your life this would not be happening the CE walked by to do 
uh, to do a check on me. I was on 15 minute checks and she saw me laying on the floor covered in my arm blood and she came running in and she put a towel on it and she goes, what is wrong with you, Aaron? What, why are you doing this? And I said, I don't want to be here anymore. I said, get me out of here. And she's like, what do you mean get you out of here? Like, do you want to go home? And I said, no, get me out of here. Like, I do not want to be alive. I do not want to be here. So then that sparked something where I was then put on a two week suicide watch. But um, I about lost it. I started throwing things in the room. I pulled my mattress off the bed. I pulled down another picture. Um, they had to give me stuff to calm mm. me down because I was just losing it. Um, and I remember I was laying in bed and I was talking to myself and my roommate was like, Aaron, what are you doing? And my arm was hanging off, off the bed and I kept talking to a guy, what I thought was a guy that was standing beside my bed and I was talking to him and I was like, cover me up, cover me up, you know, like I just kept this guy who I thought was in the room with me to cover me up. Um, she's like, Aaron's, no one's in here. I will cover you up. So she covered me up. And then I was like, thank you, thank you. And, I, and I'm just looking over at the wall talking. And in my roommate's mind, she's like, she's losing her mind. And in my mind, I thought I was seeing God. And I thought God was talking to me saying, I'm here for you. I have you. This is not the end. I am holding you. I will cover you up and I will protect you. And so that night I went to bed and I kid you not, that morning I woke up and I was free of any pain that I had been in, any, my blood pressure was good, um, my detox was fine, everything was amazing. I acted like I didn't even go through a withdrawal. I felt like 100% and that day, right then and there is when I out, that was God and he is telling me he is here with me and I... From that point on, gave everything I had to God, just based off of that moment I had at night where He was holding now me. Now I know it, it it it's difficult to put the esoteric into a clear, concise vision sometimes because you were experiencing this firsthand. You know what you heard, you know what you saw, you know the feelings that you were processing at the time. You touched on it briefly, there was this guy in the room. Can mm -hmm. you elaborate a little bit more on that experience for us? What, well just, just, can you get into more detail for us? I mean, it, it was literally just a, a, a guy, it was a figure with dark, uh, dark hair, and he didn't have a cloak or anything on like that. He had basic clothes on from what I saw, but was so a, a, a real, what, like... What I thought, I was having a genuine conversation with this gentleman, a real asking person him to cover me up. standing in your room mm -hmm. having a conversation with mm -hmm. you. Not some misty, glowing no. vision. No. My roommate said she saw nothing, wow. but it was, I vowed to this day that it was God. It was, it had to be because the next day I woke up and it was like, because in my mind it had said to me like, you know, it's not it, it's God for sure. But God right. had said to me, I have you, I am covering you, you were okay. And again, that next day, how, how was I to wake up just perfectly free of detox where those five days I've been having seizures, being hospitalized going crazy, and then the next being completely fine, blood pressure fine, everything okay. Now, was there more to the conversation than just I have you and you're gonna be okay? You said you had a conversation. It, just like he was protecting me, like type, type conversation, like your battle's over, like I have you, I am comforting you, I am here for you. Like, just give it to me. That's right. just the conversation. Um, and my roommate, she kept answering the questions because she thought I was talking to her, but I was not. <laughs> and people may oh think goodness. this is crazy, and I, I tell people to this day, and people are like, are you sure? Was it you detoxing? And I, I, it was God. It was 100% God. Kyle. Yeah. At what point 
did you hear about this? And what was your first reaction? No, uh, she told me I went up there. Uh, she's there a couple of weeks. I went up to visit her, and she told me, and I was like, "Yeah, you're detoxing." So, <laughs> you know, I didn't really. Put I get a whole that a lot. She was hallucinating. Yeah, I got it all. I still get today that you're hallucinating from it. Like that's mm -hmm. it's not real, but so. Okay, so let, let's continue with the story. You, you what, did Was the rehab successful? It was. I stayed for the 30 days, but um, Kyle had came up for a family meeting, and I gave him an ultimatum. It was crazy. I had no reason to give him an ultimatum because I had, har I had hurt him. I said, you're either with me or you're not with me. We're in this together. We're not in this together. I said, it's... Yes or no? Right now, you give me the answer. Are you with me or are you not with me? And I was like, how dare I say this? After everything I had done to him, um, rewind, he had found, this is hard for him and it's hard for me and I don't know. Okay. Um, there was a ton of financial situations I got us into as well as some infidelity, as well as some lies and manipulation um, that I had um, gotten into. I mean, they were deep, deep things that I had done. Um, and this came out after the rehab? Kyle found them all out when I was in rehab. We were not allowed to talk. Um, we were not allowed to have conversations. My therapist cut him off from talking to me. It was, it was, it was a bad, because every time we talked, we would fight. And it was just not... My therapist is like, this is not good for your recovery. You are not allowed to talk to him. So my poor husband is at home, stirring with emotions, just wanting to talk to me to get answers. And my therapist is like, nope, you may not talk. So. Oh, my Lord. So That's brutal. On September 23rd, um, very deservingly, he filed for divorce against me. And I, at that point, I deserved it while you were in rehab still. Yeah. Kyle, that had to be excruciating to come to that conclusion. And I mean, you really just reached a point where you said, I'm done. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. When she went to rehab, I, I met and went and met with uh, our preacher at the church we were going to at the time. And he told me, you know, he said he might find it hard to believe, but it's probably going to get worse. And I thought, nah, it can't get any worse than it already is. And uh, it did. You know, the longer she was in, the more um, stuff I found out. And I, I got to the point where uh, I just got to the point where I was like, I can never trust this woman again. Um, you know, it, and, and I was also looking... You know, I have, I have a three-year-old son and a five-year-old daughter, and I thought, I, I need to make sure they're taken care of. Um, and they have a stable home and, uh, you know, the, uh, the quality of life that they're used to, you know. And, and for me at the time, I thought divorce is, it felt like the only answer at the time. Um, so I went ahead and filed for divorce, and... Uh, I filed for full custody of uh, of my kids. So may I ask you, was there a lot of influence? You, I mean, obviously you had to have you shared this with your family. They knew what was going on. Were you receiving? I guess the advice that you were receiving. What were you hearing in your ear from other people? Were you being encouraged to try to save the marriage? Um, or were you being encouraged to take the action that you ultimately ended up taking? Uh, both ways. Um, you know, my, both. my family through the whole thing uh, was, was great, whether it was helping me with the kids, um, helping me financially till I was able to get stuff straightened out. They helped me a lot, and I, I owe a lot to them. But in terms of me and Aaron and our marriage, um, you know, they're like, they, they, they felt the same way. They felt like I could never trust her. And, right. you know, for them, you know, it, it hurt them as much as it hurt me, but it hurt them too. So, well, they, sure. but, and, 
and you know, but I talked to other people. These are grandkids and, well, and nieces and, and nephews, of course. Yeah, and um, you know, and that's still to this day something um, that you know the the relationship between Aaron and my family, you know. But we keep praying, um, you know, that in time God will heal those relationships as well. Of course. Um, but yeah, I, I, I you know, I I talk to different people throughout that time period that you know sure. say hey try to make it work and i was just like man you don't realize how bad it is um and and that was where i was at i just i was at the end of my i was at my breaking point where i was like i cannot do this again financially emotionally i can't go through this again i don't want to go through it again I'm done aaron you said now Deservedly so. So in hindsight, at the time when you were served and you realized your husband, as you said, you gave him an ultimatum, are you with me or not? He said, <laughs> nope. How did that hit you? Well, I had gotten out of rehab. I had stayed with my parents for about a day or two until I was um, I actually wasn't served with a divorce papers until three days out of rehab. I had gotten the custody papers prior to, to rehab, I mean, like my mom had received them. Um, so we went and saw the attorney for me and she said, you know, you need to get your own place. There, no court is gonna give you custody if you can't even take care of yourself. And it was, it was a long spiel. So I ended right. up getting myself an apartment. Um, when I was finally served the, divor the divorce papers, to me that was like Kyle saying like, I'm done. I didn't even try. Like, we're done. This is it. I've come to my, because we both came, you know, we were both at a point where we were like, divorce is not an option. But when Kyle made it an option for him, that's when I saw, you know, this, he's done. I done it. I ruined everything we worked on. Um, so we went to the custody hearing, um, and we did end up doing a, a custody agreement that essentially in full physical custody of the kids. Um, during that time, that first and second week out of rehab, we barely talked. We talked a minimum, just enough to, to deal with the children. Um, again, I was living in the apartment by myself. Um, I had went over there and I vowed myself like, okay, Aaron, this is it. This is your last chance. You need to talk to him. You need to, to figure things out. Where are you going from here? Is he definitely 100% wanting this divorce so i went over and i confessed myself to him and i told him everything and i cried and i bawled and he laughed at me and oh, and wow. you know what i deserved it i deserved to be laughed at because i had just put him through that so right there was my answer he's done he's done but i was like you know what he may be done but i ain't done and that moment is when i vowed to not stop those divorce papers. I was going to take that year, you know, state of Pennsylvania, you have a year and if you don't sign those papers in a year, then the divorce is allowed to proceed. And I decided like, I don't care. I'm taking that year. I'm showing him that I can be the wife he wants me to be. I am showing him that I can change. I'm showing him that I know I lie. I will not manipulate. I will not do anything. I want to be perfect. I'm going to be that perfect way for him. You know, not perfect, but um, it probably took almost two months of us talking on and off for us to even get cordial with each other. After probably two months, we then started talking and deciding that we were going to see where our marriage would go. We both vowed to give it a chance. I repented and, and and you know i i gave everything to god i told him i was like i lied i cheated i manipulated i was an addict i did all these things and i said god forgave me kyle why can you not forgive me? like you know uh, you can forgive me you just you just have to you just have to try and so here we are wow. on this journey um that that that's a tall order kyle um Talk to us a little bit. Uh, how do you go from where you were in your mindset, in your heart? Obviously, you sought counsel. 
you said you were, at the time you were a believer. You had to have reconciled this with God that you were justified in ending your marriage to come to that decision and then to turn around after a couple months of conversation, having an about face. Was this a gradual transition and change in your mindset or was this an epiphany moment? Uh, how, how does that happen? Well, I know when I filed for divorce, um, looking back, it, it wasn't something I wanted to do. But at the time, I, I felt like that was what I had to do. You um, didn't have a choice. Either. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I still loved Aaron. Uh, you, you, even in spite of everything that happened, you don't quit, quit loving somebody. Um, so, you know, I, I, the love was still there. And, um, you know, I, God put people in my life that were able to um, kind of guide me along the way. Uh, a friend of mine and a co-worker Jimmy. has been a huge help uh, from the get go. Um, uh, Kevin Orndorff, who, who does our marriage counseling has really, we owe him a lot to, uh, where we're at Pastor today. Orndorf. Yes. Yeah, we, did we an had interview. him on the show yeah. talking about, uh, are you recovery? Which um, I'm involved in. So yeah. yeah, he just called me last week actually. And, uh, he's going to come back on the show and yeah. we're going to continue, uh, doing teaching sessions here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wonderful man. But well, I'm glad to hear that you're connected with them. Yeah, we uh, we got involved uh, with the new church in Dubois uh, Life Community Church, and uh, the people there, um, uh, yep, Pastor they're just James great. Goodman. Pastor and, Goodman, uh, I yeah. am well well aware. Of great people doing wonderful work in our community, and um, you know, just had people put in my life that that you know kind of helped me along the way. Uh, was able to really look at my life and, you know, the shortcomings that I've had, you know, nobody's perfect. You know, I dealt with stuff, um, you know, over the years. Um, and, and it was, I, I didn't want my kids to grow up in a broken home. I didn't want, um, I felt like if, if we didn't work things out that Aaron would read, and I loved this girl, and I thought, I don't want 10 years from now for my kids to say, why did you give up on mom? Or, you know, why didn't you, you do you more for her? Yeah. Um, you know, there's many reasons why, and I felt, uh, Orndorff uh, just talked to me one night, and he said, you know, God doesn't bring any two people together um, to take them apart, you know, through sickness and, and, and health, you know, and... I'd say with Aaron, it was, it was a sickness. Um, so I, I decided, you know, over a course of time that we'll try. And, uh, you know, it's been a long, hard journey, but, uh, you know, it's been worth it. We've, we've grown a lot in our faith. Um, we've, we've grown closer together. Um, you know, but we're still a work in progress. You know, still days where... I have a lot of anger, hurt. You know, there's still times that it's just, it's a lot to, to bear, but. Um, well, may, may I ask you now, um, Aaron, you had made mention about the RU Recovery, that you're a part of that. Um, Kyle, have you taken part in these sessions as well? Are you engaged in marriage counseling? Is it uh, a, a faith-based counseling? Yeah. What are you, what are you guys doing in terms of the, the nuts and the bolts, the mechanics of keeping your marriage together. Yeah, we're, we uh, we go to marriage counseling uh, with with Pastor Kevin Wardor, so it's all faith based. Um, as far as are you, I, I went to Christmas party, but that's it. Um, but we, in our relationship, even at home, you know, um, trying to pray together, do devotionals together. Um, we're not by any means great at it. I mean there's days we skip but we really try to um to put that at the center of our relationship because i've come to find that that when we don't that you know you can feel it you can sense it you know you drift apart um so it's a big thing for us uh you know getting involved with the church and and, and doing stuff and 
surrounding yourself with uh, with you know the right group of people and not putting yourself into positions where um, you know Aaron could relapse or, or you know something I could you know potentially you know make a mistake and do something wrong so right so Aaron the church community you said you you had a you had a bit of difficulty with uh, uh, people within the community, and I'm not, I, I say community at large, you, you started the conversation talking about the judgment <laughs> that you had to face from people in our community and how difficult that was. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. How have, you, how have you come to terms with that? How do you deal with that? And, I mean, people are people, you know, Christian or not, <laughs> or in a church or not. <laughs> Uh, yeah. We're all human beings, and you know we we can uh, we can uh, walk down the wrong path sometimes in terms of how we treat other people. So, what kind of struggles did you have to deal with, and how do you? Deal with it? This is a tough one for me. Um, I, I'm sure it is, and I'm I, sorry. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. If it's something you don't feel comfortable talking about, we can we can gloss over that and move on. No, I think it's just very important for people to understand that just because I made those mistakes. Well, it is, and that's that's why I brought that yeah. up, and you alluded to it at the beginning, and I thought, you know, why is that so important? Because, let's face it, that's a huge part of healing, mm -hmm. and one of the big hurdles of healing, or hurdles to healing, is dealing with what other people think about us and how they perceive us. So I appreciate your courage addressing that. You know, I, I'm, I'm more scared of the judgment than I am of relapsing. And unfortunately that it shouldn't be that way. Um, mm. I have faced so much judgment through this. Um, I'm not a monster because I did terrible things. Doesn't mean I'm a terrible person. You know, when I repented to God for what I did, I repented for my sin, I repented for my addiction, I repented for my lies, and I repented for everything, and God forgave me for everything. And I don't think I should have to every day be convicted of that because of something I did. You know, um, to this day, even today, you know, I know I hear people talking about me. I, I know people are off in the little corner saying things about me. I know there's group of people that get together and talk, you know, I, I, I know these things, and sure. people act like I don't, um, but you know what, all I can say, and I've said this to Kyle numerous times, is hurt people hurt people, and right. I understand that, and, and the best I can do is pray, is pray for them, because obviously they're hurting in some way, um, they're hurting by something I must have done, or vice versa, and so for that, I pray for them. Um, and it's amazing that you have the courage of these convictions of yours to come on this public forum like this mm -hmm. knowing what's going on oh yeah and no, and knowing again you know, as you said the personalities or the cliques or the circles mm -hmm. that you know that are uh, casting those dispersions you, here mm -hmm. you are publicly looking into the camera and saying to people you know what i am standing with god mm -hmm. i know who i was created to be i know who i am in his eyes and I know he's with me and in me and with my family and in my family. Right. And that is a pop. That's why I wanted to have you on the show. When I first met you and we talked those first few times and then when you told me your whole story, I said, you know what? This is what this show is all about mm -hmm. is what you're doing and talk about putting faith in motion. This is... This is powerful stuff. God bless the both of you mm -hmm. for your courage, for the example that you're setting for others. Um, I know, Kyle, you have a commitment. You're going to need to go ahead and wrap mm -hmm. this up. So um, I'll give you two the last word. Is there anything else that you want to add? Um, advice, thoughts, closing thoughts from Kyle and Aaron Hepner. Go ahead. Um, I would just like to say, like, you know, to any of the addicts out there who are struggling with coming forward or struggling with um, being judged or anything, uh, don't. I'm, I'm being as raw as it can be. And you know what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. No matter my sin, no matter what I did in the past, I am forgiven. And that's because of God. And, you know, people may not forgive me, but that's okay. Um, 
God has forgiven me, and and that in itself um, is enough for me. Uh, that that may sound greedy, that may sound selfish, but um, God is at the top of our relationship right now, and and you know that's where He's going to stay. Um, you know, if, if anybody, if, if they need anything, if anybody needs anything. I am here to talk. I am an open book. I will not sugarcoat it. And, and I just want people to know that there is hope. Kyle and I, we're a success story. We may, you know, we may not have it all together. We don't have it all together, but together we have it all. And I mean, you know, God, God is, is big for us. And without God, we would be totally different. My kids would have a mom and a dad that weren't together. And, and thanks to God. You know, I've fallen more in love with Kyle than I have ever been in my life, and I, and I, and I definitely contribute that to having faith and, and to being strong and vulnerable and not caring what oh, people think. Story. Well, thank you so much. Kyle, closing thoughts from you? Uh, yeah, I guess I would just say, uh, you know, never give up. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what, what you may be going through um, with prayer and uh faith you know you, you can overcome anything so i just say uh to, to not give up and uh to trust in god that uh he'll get you through it outstanding beautiful 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 you are a lovely young couple i am so honored and proud to know you thank to you call you friend to call you brother and sister in our lord jesus and I can't tell you what this means to me that you've honored this broadcast with coming on, and exhibiting this courage that you have, sharing this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful testimony. Um, Aaron and Kyle Hepner, thank you so much for coming here and, and uh, showing what it means to put faith in motion. God bless you both. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, folks, that is it. That is our episode of The Kinetic. My name is Sam Natero, and if you would like to learn more about the show, you can visit me at thekinetic.org. And you can also, let me pull the music down here. Um, you can also get hold of me on Facebook, PM me. You find me there at Sam Atero. And um, find the Kinetic stream wherever you can and share it, like it, push it out there. We appreciate it. Um, oh, some pretty big news coming. I have a very special guest that's going to be coming on to the show. Uh, we're working out the details uh, here, and I'm not going to divulge who it is, but uh, uh, it's going to be a pretty interesting show, different angle, different take on the show. Um, that's going to be happening, hopefully, it's looking like potentially later this week or next week, so stick around for that announcement. And I want to thank everybody who's been patient with me and encouraged me, because as you may have noticed, I've taken a few months off from this broadcast, and this is... This is my calling and my ministry and what I believe that God has brought uh, my talents and my time on this planet to, that, uh, to help people share their stories of how they've put their faith in motion and have made, uh, or I should say, opened up and allowed God to make changes in, for the better in their lives as they've healed from, struggled with, healed from, and come out of addiction. That is what the Kinetic is all about. And if you have a story to tell, if you are an educator, if you are in the faith-based community, if you are uh, a, a public health professional, maybe somebody that wants to teach, we have, uh, as I said, Pastor Warrendorf from RU Recovery and, uh, is here in Dubois is going to be coming on and teaching some, uh, some practical Bible-based lessons here on dealing with and healing from recovery. Um, we have some previous guests that are also going to be coming on doing more of these types of sessions. So if you'd like to be a guest on The Kinetic, hit me up and uh, I would love to talk with you and help you share your story with the world. From my home studios in Dubois, Pennsylvania, specifically beautiful Treasure Lake, Pennsylvania. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Sam Tara.